All right, hello everybody. Good morning, and welcome to Discovery on Discovery Day Online from the Raymond M. Alf Museum of Paleontology. Uh, my name is Gabriel Santos. I am the Collections and Outreach Coordinator at the Alf Museum, and today is all about how science and art combine to talk about or bringing ancient worlds to life. Right? It's you know we look at fossils as paleontologists and scientists and. Um, we have no real way of knowing how these things actually look like. So to make these fossils, these extinct animals, be more alive for audiences and to appreciate them just a little bit more, we work with amazing paleo artists who, have, you, who use science and art to really make the, these amazing, beautiful living creatures through their art. And this morning, I am very, very excited to have as our first guest, uh, renowned artist Mark Hallett. Hello, Mark. Welcome to Discovery Day Online. Hi there, Gabe. It's really exciting for me to be here with you and your viewers. Thanks so much for having me on. And, it's um, our pleasure. What I'd like... Oh, thank you. Well, what I'd like to do today is to share with you a couple of uh, paleo reconstruction projects on uh, ancient mammals uh, that I've been working on over the last few months to several years. And... Um, to begin with, uh, let me just switch this over. So tell me if it shows all right, Gabe. Uh, I yeah, think that you've looks got great. a good, good. You've got a good view of a uh, restoration of a uh, the classic saber-toothed cat, Smilodon fatalis, which has been discovered for years at the La Brea Tar Pits in Los Angeles, California. I did this uh, for a lecture. Uh, to show how uh, it might look in life. We have no idea about the actual colors or patterns, but I thought I would uh, try that. And um, so we are very lucky to have uh, uh, almost beautiful, perfect fossil skulls to, uh, to be able to do restorations from. This is uh, the skull of uh, Macaritus nihuanensis, from China, which was a early Pleistocene form. And uh, so we often, uh, in the case of Ice Age uh, mammals, have very good materials around. Tell me if I'm okay on that. Suppose That's we have tiny. something like this. Um, does that show okay, Gabe? Yeah, looks good. Okay, now this is the um, very badly battered, crushed skull of a a uh, type of saber tooth that was very different from the um, classic saber tooth. These were not cats. These are called nimravids. And uh, this, along with the humerus bone, were the only things that were found of this particular saber tooth uh, in the Badlands of South Dakota. And uh, you can see that it, of course, it does look like a skull. You can see the cheekbone the eye socket, the brain case, uh, uh, and part of the muscle. But you can see that it's been very, very badly battered and crushed. So what do you do with something like this? How do you go about uh, making a um, reconstruction of it? So uh, let me just take you through some of the processes of uh, dealing with something like this and trying to bring it to life. Here we have uh, pictures of um, the humerus that I just showed you before, the humerus being the upper arm bone of the animal. And um, we fortunately have a few close relatives of this particular saber tooth. For example, Eusmilus ducotensis. And you can see that this skull has suffered a much better fate throughout geologic time. It's not crushed. It's not squashed. Uh, it's in much better shape. Um, like the uh, original uh, uh, animal that I showed you that I'm going to be doing the restoration of, it does not have its, have its saber teeth. These were lost a long time ago, but the skull is in pretty good shape. So we're using this as an uh, example of uh, a close relative that we could maybe get some clues as to how we could uh, make a... Um, reconstruction of this animal. And uh, to begin with, I started out by making careful 
drawings of the actual skull. In this case, you can see that I've done one from the side, uh, one from the left side, and one from the right side. But this is the actual size of the fossil skull. So this made it uh, much easier to do a drawing from. But I showed every imperfection, every crease and dent um, in the skull to make sure that I knew what it looked like before I actually started trying to figure out how it would have looked in its original state. Here's the skull from the front and the back. Here it is looking from underneath. Here would be the throat. We're looking at it from the top, the nose, the two eyes, and these big areas on either side of the skull were for massive muscles that closed the lower jaw. Here's the lower jaw. Uh, uh, mammals like this have their uh, lower jaws in two pieces. So when it broke, it broke flat and it didn't suffer the same kind of distortion that, uh, that it might have otherwise. Here's from the front, from the inner side and from the outer side. So when I started working on uh, reconstructing the skull, I used You smile, this is my example. And uh, the resemblances were close enough so that I got some and of the underside again. And you can see that I've uh, gone ahead and uh, reconstructed it according to its close relative. Um, back during the Renaissance time, there was a technique called the eye as a light source, which I used for doing reconstructions like this. And instead of positioning a light from one side or the other side, you imagine that the light source is coming from your own eyes. This way, you don't need to rely on having a lamp in a certain position all the time. You can calculate how close the object is, in this case, a skull is to your own eye. And by good fortune, this is very similar to a technique that we use when we're examining skulls with a computer process called uh, computerized axial tomography that shoots uh, rays to uh, all over the skull to bring a image forth. It's like if you remember connecting dots. When we connected dots, if you had enough of them, you could actually create an image. Well, in this case, the computer scanner shoots not just a few, but thousands and thousands of uh, points of light at an object. And eventually you get so many that you have the ability to connect all these areas. And by using a computer technology to round out that process using a program to so-called smooth it, you can create an effect very much like this. But long before I had heard about doing this, I used the eyes light source technique um, to be able to recreate uh, drawings of bones like this. And it helps us visualize it. Here's. A front view of the skull and the back view and I've restored the appearance of the two huge canines or sabers uh, that uh, all of these cats had. So you get the idea that it's much more, it's beginning to look a lot more like, like it really should. If I'm holding this correctly, I'm not sure. Here's a side view. And again, you can see that if we use this totally unrelated saber tooth, which was a cat, the creature I'm doing was not a cat, but you can see that um, it's starting to look more the way it did in life. Now, at this point, having figured out what the skull should look like, I want to go on to the entire body. So at this point, let me just, and Gabe, you can guide me and tell me whether I'm messing this up or not. Can you see it properly? Is it 
Is it yeah, uh, properly visible? Looks, yeah, that looks. If you if you lay it, push it back a little bit, I think it'll be fine. Yeah. Oh, it looks okay. Good right there. How is that? Yeah, that looks good. Is that coming through okay? All right. Well, in this case, um, what we have is a um, fairly complete skeleton of another relative of the Chadron saber tooth that was found. This was called Hoplophonius, and this was discovered uh, quite a long time ago during the, uh, I believe, sometime during the 1920s. But I took the skull reconstruction and scaled it down that I did of the Chadron saber tooth so that it was at the same size as Hoplophonius. And the fact that Hoplophonius has given me a much more complete skeleton allowed me to go ahead and um, do some uh, figuring out as to the shape and the uh, size of the bones. Again, we have the upper arm bone or humerus. And by making measurements of the circumference of the humerus, the um, width of the bone, um, and uh, other areas on the skeleton, we can kind of figure out how hefty or how much mass the animal had. So in this case, what I did was to use these techniques to recreate the way the skeleton would look. And then once having done the skeleton, the next stage is to do a muscular reconstruction. And uh, in the past, I've dissected animals uh, and used uh, anatomical studies by a number of other people to determine, let's say, what the uh, musculature of a typical cat, like a bobcat or a tiger, would be. So uh, I use these when I was doing this reconstruction. After doing a complete body reconstruction, I focused once more on the head. And this is what I think the muscles of the head of the, uh, of the Chadron saber tooth would have looked like. So in this case, uh, I was much more confident of the uh, appearance of some of the smaller muscles, so I went ahead and did that. So once we have an idea of what the animal's head should look like, I start thinking about life poses. And here's a sketch that I did of the Chadron saber tooth the way it might have appeared in life. I haven't given it any sort of a color patterning, but this shows some of the characteristics of the animal. It had a rather longish muzzle, very atypical of, uh, let's say, something like a cat saber tooth, much more like a, uh, a canid or dog. But there it was, it had a longer muzzle, and uh, uh, right now we don't really know why that was true. Most saber tooths had fairly short noses, so uh, in this case it was long. But once I've determined what I want the um, animal to look like in a life portrait, uh, I'm ready to go ahead and uh, go through the process of transferring it onto a piece of illustration board to actually do a full color painting. And in this case, uh, things like tracing paper is your best friend. What I did was take a piece of tracing paper, lightly trace the animal, uh, and then on the back of it, use pastel. And once I covered the underside of the drawing with pastel, I took this, uh, adhered it onto the illustration board, and then with a the hard pencil, gone ahead and actually traced the animal's outline and the colored pastel actually traces that on so I get a perfect um, reproduction of the original image that I want. So that's uh, a trick that illustrators use in recreating a prehistoric animal's appearance as a color illustration. And then finally, I was ready to do the actual painting. And here's what I decided it should look like. I went ahead and I used the coloration of a cougar or a mountain lion. However, I frequently use things like um, uh, actual skins that I can manipulate under light to figure out how other uh, animals' uh, color patterns might look. Uh, we really don't know what, uh, what kind of pattern or what kind of markings the animal would have had in life. Um, so it's really up to the artist to make that decision. 
So uh, how are we doing on time, Gabe? Uh, how much time do we have left? You got plenty of time. Don't worry about it. Okay. Say about uh, 15 minutes or so? Yeah. Okay. Well, um, let's see. I think, um, oh, one thing I wanted to show you before I wanted to get on to Desmond Stylians, which I thought you might enjoy. Um, I wanted to show our viewers what it might look like if you were to take um, a painted reconstruction like this and do a full scale scene. This is a um, the scene of a of a um, locality in uh, northwest England during the Wyxellian period of the Ice Age, and uh, I'll just tilt it a little bit so you can see it more. But uh, this features saber-toothed cats, Ice Age lions, a cave bear, mammoths, caribou, horses, cave hyenas. Uh, Arctic foxes, meadow larks, ravens, and a number of other small mammals. So this is what I would do, for example, in uh, taking uh, what I did with the uh, illustration I showed you and putting it into an entire scene. So this was part of a book uh, that I uh, published several years ago, uh, wrote and illustrated on uh, the origin of the big cats. So uh, this gives you some idea about how an artist would recreate an entire world like this. Well, let me see. There it is. I wanted to show you... Uh, some more recent work that I've been doing for um, for um, a project involving some uh, very unusual, strange sea creatures called Desmostylians. And Gabe, again, tell me if this is showing up well enough. I can move it around. Uh, well, looks great. But um, okay, this is the skeleton of uh, Desmostylus hesperus, um, which has been discovered along the um, the northwest coast of Japan and the uh, northeast coast of California and the northwest, going all the way from Alaska down to Southern California. And these are intriguing creatures because they're the only sea mammals that have totally become extinct. And we're finding out more and more about them as we go along. Um, fortunately, sea creatures um, have the good fortune to be preserved fairly well compared to ones on land. Um, they get covered up quickly and um, we sometimes find much more complete skeletons than uh, we do of land animals. But at any rate, they were very unusual. They were um, about uh, usually on the average as big as a modern hippo. Uh, and we really don't know too much about precisely their origins, but they were herbivores. Uh, and they may have uh, swam uh, in the shallow areas and rooted around for uh, plants, uh, like seagrasses and other things. So, again, what I've done, as I did with the Chadron saber tooth, is to do um, skeletal, and, whoops, skeletal and skull reconstructions. So here we have some the two main um, Desmostylians, Paleoparadoxians, and then Desmostylus itself. <clears throat> what I wanted to do was to get a good idea of the skull from the side, from the top, and from the bottom before I actually started trying to restore what they looked like. And we can see that they were rather different looking animals. Here I've taken the skull and um, added musculature to round them out and give them some sort of a fleshy form. And we have much better skulls to work with when, than we do on the uh, Chadron saber tooth. But again, 
I use what I call orthographic views, which means looking straight at the animal from a given side, from the side, from the um, from the front, and sometimes from the top. So uh, using this, I came up with some muscular reconstructions of how I felt it might look, basing it on dissections of uh, hippos and other animals that were done by Jonathan Kingdon during the 1970s. These are simplified head drawings um, to show how they might look uh, going past the muscle stage. One thing about uh, both of these animals is that they probably, um, although they aren't preserved. They probably had very stiff vibrissae or whiskers like a walrus to help them uh, feel around in the substrate or the um, muddy bottom to find the plants that they were eating. We really don't know, again, what kind of plants they, they were uh, munching on, but probably the whiskers might have helped them a lot. So here we are, uh, Paleoparadoxus and Desmostylus again. This is a uh, uh, drawing that I did for fun to see what the animal might have looked like in life. And uh, here we have a, a modern uh, woman diver by comparison to give you some idea of the scale. But uh, you can see that they were about as big as a hippopotamus. And uh, so they would have been a very uh, fascinating thing to have encountered um, if you were swimming uh, about maybe uh, 25 or 30 million years ago. And uh, my friend Ray Troll, and I want to show you this, has done a series of delightful uh, uh, shirts showing, showing paleontology. And he, like myself and Gabe, are very fascinated by the Desmond Stylings. So this is an example of Ray's work. I wrote, wore it today for uh, fun and inspiration. So um, at any rate, um, I guess I'm ready for some questions if uh, you are and your viewers are, Gabe. Yeah, that sounds great. I, will, I really want to say that how much I love the Desmostillion illustrations. For those of you who don't know, I, I had studied Desmostillions at one point in my life, and so seeing them are awesome. And um, Kumiko Matsui, who was another Desmostillion expert, is in the chat, and uh, she just said she loves them as well, so... Those are really, really beautiful specimens. They're so fascinating. They're they're so unlike any other creatures we know of. Um, and there were there were so many other uh, animals alive at that time. Here we're talking about um, the late Oligocene to to through the Miocene epochs, um, anywhere from oh, probably about three to. Uh, to possibly 15 million years ago. Uh, there, of course, weren't any uh, humans to be surfing with these animals, but there were um, amazing fish. There were gigantic sharks around. There were primitive sea lions and seals. There were these strange um, mammals called oyster bears that were uh, uh, arctoid bear-like creatures that may have gone after oysters that swam around. So if you were diving and paddling around, you would have seen all kinds of amazing uh, sea creatures. The Miocene was such an exciting period of time in uh, prehistoric history. Oh yeah, I could go on and on about the Miocene, but we're here to talk about your work. So I think okay. to get things started, you know, like for those of you who may not know, Mark Hallett, you are such a renowned artist. You've done thing, beautiful illustrations for museums. Your work has been featured in National Geographic. You've even done some work for like Jurassic Park. How, yes. what kind of training do you, did you have that goes into um, creating science illustration? Cause you know, I think it's still art, right? It's beautiful. And there's, there's obviously a lot of inspiration behind it, but there, it has to be grounded in science, correct? So Yes. What is your training to do science illustration and bring animals to life? Well, when I was uh, in college, there really were no um, formal uh, training curricula for uh, for paleontology or paleontology art. Uh, so I got in through the back door, so to speak, through the cracks. Um, I started volunteering at the Los Angeles County Museum of Natural History during the early 1970s, uh, I, I loved having 
the ability to contact and touch actual fossil bones. So I was cleaning saber-toothed cat skulls and uh, um, uh, preparing them for exhibit. Uh, but uh, I got to do my work uh, by not only uh, acting as a preparator, but when I was needed, actually uh, creating drawings for um, students who needed them for um uh, uh, sometimes for outdoor illustrations in the case of the uh, La Brea Tar Pits, which actually later on gave rise to the uh, Page Museum. And uh, uh, so uh, I sort of slipped in through the back. And um, I was very fortunate in having a, uh, a professor, an art teacher, Richard Oden, mm -hmm who uh, actually uh, in 1972 gave us the assignment of choosing a prehistoric uh, animal to restore for a project. And um, for fun out of the blue, I chose a uh, gigantic seabird called Ostia Duntornis ori, which was distantly related to pelicans, but which had actually uh, bony, um, bony um, protuberances, almost like teeth coming from its jaws. So... Um, so this is uh, this is something that uh, I did as as my project, and by great good fortune, the Los Angeles County Museum of Natural History in Los Angeles was reconstructing their halls. They wanted to do a paleo mammal and bird hall, so they said, "Hey, Mark, uh, could we have that?" <laughs> and I said, <laughs> "Well, sure." <laughs> so I gave that to them. I donated the the artwork, and basically, what it was is I took uh, viewers through the uh, reconstruction of the skeleton, uh, the musculature, and then finally I showed the uh, bird uh, soaring overhead over a stormy uh, California seascape with a little desmostylene in the, in the water. <laughs> At that time, I didn't know very much about them, but I thought they were kind of cool. So I'll just go ahead and put that in there. So um, uh, one thing that Terry just reminded me of, uh, Gabe, is that um, uh, in addition to... Uh, uh, my volunteering, I uh, took uh, scientific illustration courses at the City of Hope National Medical Center in Duarte, California, when I was in junior college. Uh, it was a program uh, in conjunction with Citrus Junior College in Azusa. So I learned some of my scientific drawing techniques, which served me very well when I wanted to do later work for other individuals. But uh, in a roundabout way, just to get back to your original question, I didn't have any formal training in paleontology illustration. I basically just over the years uh, worked in that area myself and been very fortunate to have had people who uh, asked me to do work for them and actually to have made a career out of it. Um, I just noticed uh, the other day when I was um, checking over dates that I've been doing this now for about 50 years. The Ostia wow. went back to 1972. So uh, I'm so lucky to to be doing what I do, but I, I sincerely love it. I really like nature and I'm intrigued by the ancient past. Uh, nowadays, there are curricula that uh, are offered at various universities and schools in paleontology. Uh, at the moment, I know of nothing that uh, focuses specifically on paleo restoration. However, there may be something like that now that I just don't know about. So I would encourage uh, anyone who's interested in doing this to uh, uh, start Googling, start researching, uh, doing some uh, of their homework to try to find out where they could study this sort of thing. But um, in the meantime, I am very happy to communicate with anyone who would like to get in touch with um, uh, someone like myself to do this. So um, please contact me. I'd be more than happy to share my experiences, to talk to you about it. I can tell you all about techniques. Um, one thing that I would suggest doing would be to um, uh, align myself with a museum and see if there might be some uh, project in which you could create illustrations. Um, money is always tight in uh, paleontological research. Uh, so uh, if you are willing to volunteer your work uh, for a project, that will help you get in through the door. And once you get your work published, then that's the next step to being able to do something else, to be able to create another project. So uh, that's one way to do it. And that's pretty much what I did. That's awesome. Thanks for all the advice. And, you know, there's a lot of folks out there who will put, who, who have been inspired by your work throughout the many years. You know, you think of paleo art, like some classic, amazing pieces. It's like Charles R. Knight and like, 
your stuff. So I think a lot of people are going to be, might be contacting you more after watching. Well, that would be them, fine. So. And I'm glad you brought up Charles R. Knight because um, uh, he, along with Sednick Brian, were uh, some of the uh, greatest uh, paleo artists of their, their lifetime. Uh, Charles Knight um, did some of the very classic uh, reconstructions of prehistoric animals, uh, dinosaurs, mammals, etc. But I was personally very inspired by uh, yet another artist, J.H. Maternus, who did the... Um, uh, classic land mammal stage uh, murals for the U.S. National Museum of Natural History in Washington, D.C. And sadly, these have been taken off exhibit for one reason or another. But uh, Jay's work was what inspired me when uh, I was in my early 20s to be able to think about going into this as a career. And um, let me just show you one, one other thing if we have time. Yeah, sure. There is a um, magazine that's published quarterly um, called Prehistoric Times, and um, uh, one of the one of the more recent things is this um, reconstruction of a Neanderthal woman that I did for a couple of issues back. But uh, Neanderthals are in the news a lot these days because we're finding out more and more information about them. For example, just recently, um, the baby tooth of a modern, anatomically modern human being like us Homo sapiens was actually found in a French cave. Um, and uh, the amazing thing is that um, a modern humans actually uh, lived in the cave before uh, Neanderthals resumed living there. So uh, this dates, the tooth dates back to about 54,000 years ago. And uh, after a period of about 40 years, the modern humans moved out and Neanderthals moved back in. So the amazing thing is, is that it looks like Neanderthals and modern humans, Homo sapiens, were actually uh, coexisting for about 10,000 years. It wasn't a case in which uh, our our species f dispersed into Europe and killed off the Neanderthals or uh, created some uh, situation in which they died out. We actually shared the turf with them, and that's quite an amazing thing. But um, in addition to uh, to uh, mammals, uh, the dinosaurs are are always perennially a subject of fascination. Here's Deinonychus. Um, but uh, I do dinosaurs as well as ancient uh, fossil mammals. So um, anyway, what uh, I don't want to talk all this time. Tell me if you have any other questions. I, yeah, I have a que another question. Sure. Um, we have a couple from the audience as well. But kind oh, of sure. shifting, shifting tones a little bit. You know, you've done work for National Geographic, like you said, museums. Yep. And you've also done work for like Jurassic Park, Prehistoric Times. Do you find there's a difference in the in the way that you have to create something for those different types of media, like creating a piece for a museum versus creating art for something like Jurassic Park? Is there a difference in, in the way you approach it? Well, very much so. Um, uh, when you're working for a museum, of course, accuracy and validity are the paramount goals. Um, and uh, so one works very hard to make uh, one's work as accurate as possible. Uh, but in the case of uh, working for a uh, uh, film project like Jurassic Park, uh, it was supposed to be basically uh, scientific fantasy or science fiction fantasy. <coughs> so um, uh, Steven Spielberg, the uh, director and producer, wanted the animals to be as impressive and hopefully scary as possible, even though he did respect scientific accuracy. So, um, uh, for example, uh, uh, the so-called raptors, the uh, Deinonychids, were, were bigger than uh, they were at that time, although... Uh, uh, Strangely enough, life imitated art in the fact that uh, a giant uh, Deinonychid was actually discovered, which nicely filled in the idea that uh, Jurassic Park could have once that big. But um, 
some of the animals like the spitter were not real. I was asked by Steve Spielberg to come up with a uh, scary looking little little mini dinosaur uh, and uh, he kept adding things onto it. He basically was fine that it was based on a real dinosaur, Dilophosaurus. Uh, however, he wanted things added onto it like a frill from an Australian uh, fringe lizard and he wanted inflatable air sacs and he wanted it to be <laughs> like a snake. So uh, eventually what happened is that I came up with this chimera creature and finally after oh, maybe about uh, five to ten drawings, uh, I, I gave the... Um, the uh, film assistant at the uh, drawing that I did and he gave it to Steve Spielberg and he liked it. So that's <laughs> why we see a, saw a spitter in the first Jurassic Park and from the trailer I think I saw that there was actually a spitter in there as well. So yeah. we're going to see the little critter again. Uh, but uh, that just shows you how uh, sometimes it's not as important for um, films uh, to have uh, such accuracy. In one of the last... Um, Jurassic Park films, Jurassic World, uh, the stegosaurs were far bigger than they really were, but they looked impressive. Uh, anyway, um, that's one of the differences, but uh, I love showing animals the, the way they were. I think uh, dinosaurs were very impressive at the size that they were. I don't think we have to make them any bigger or scarier. I think that they were really great. Oh, I agree, but I will also say that your creation of that Dilophosaurus, little uh, four-year-old me it, going to watch Jurassic Park for the first time. One, I was absolutely terrified of Dilophosaurus because I was afraid, like, seeing something like that, thinking that it might attack me for some reason was <laughs> so scary. But I also somehow also fell in love with that creature. And I remember going to the library and looking up as much as I could of Dilophosaurus because of, like, that really interesting way that you created like that chimera creature it it really sparked something that made me want to learn more about it and i learned a lot more about the real dilophosaurus because of the way that you created that chimera creature oh that's really great well it sounds as if the very fact that you were scared of it a little bit made it kind of your dinosaur <laughs> kind of yep. your special dinosaur that's really great Most definitely um let's see here's a question from uh one of the u user hot dog and it kind of has a sec. We'll add a second question to that. So the painting that you showed of that reconstruction from England, I believe, is what you said. Oh yes. Um, mm -hmm. uh, is that acrylic art, or is that acrylic painting? And onto that, what is like your favorite medium to use when you're creating these kind of pieces? Oh, yes. I'm glad you asked me that, Gabe. Uh, well, that, that actually was painted in a medium called designer's colors, and I'll show you these in just a second. These are, this is white, but uh, this is a big tube of it. Usually the tubes are about uh, this size. And um, uh, designer's colors are also called opaque water colors. And in France, they're called gouache. And basically, it's a, uh, a very thick water color uh, with very high color saturation, which is really great because the colors will be very intense. But... Um, uh, you can thin them way, way down, just like those little, uh, uh, remember the little praying watercolor kits that we had, the little cakes that you put water in, and you mixed it up? Well, those were great when you were in kindergarten, but you could never get them to be very thick. They were always really watery and thin. Well, these guys you can really make as thick as you want. You can, uh, they come out... Uh, like a like toothpaste, it's that consistency. But you can use them very thick, what uh, we call an art impasto. Uh, you could use a little, a tiny knife to put them on. But what I like about them is that you can thin them way down. And also you can re-dissolve them. So um, I could do a painting like the one that I showed you and go away for decades and then come back and just add a little water to it. And I could re-dissolve it and start painting again. So unlike acrylic paints, which are made of, uh, have a plastic base, and when they dry are insoluble or they're hard, um, these are always uh, soluble. And even if they dry up in your tube, all you have to do is just take something like a razor blade or an X-Acto knife, make a slit in them, and then put them in warm water and they'll reconstitute and you can use them again. So never throw your old um, designer's <laughs> colors away. But uh, uh, here's some of the brushes that I use with it. Uh, I go and use anything from a flat brush 
to uh, uh, to uh, bright brushes, round brushes like this. These are well used. They're a little splayed out by now, but uh, tiny pointed brushes as well. Uh, and then in terms of uh, working on my sketches, I use both hard and soft pencils like this. So very ordinary things for sketching. The, um, the opaque watercolors can be substituted with... Uh, with uh, with the uh, harder watercolors that are less water soluble, but I like them because I can change them a lot. And often in scientific illustration, uh, you're asked to change the way something looks because you'll find out that you've made a mistake and you have to redo it. So that's one really good reason for making it so that you can change things over and over and over again. And uh, let me just put that painting back up so we can see it once more. Hopefully it shows up a little. Yeah, that pretty. looks good right there. But uh, you can see some of the details in it. But uh, for example, I um, I um, use feathering techniques when I lay down my color. I brush sometimes layers of pure color over it to intensify it. Um, one good thing about gouache is that being soluble, you can uh, you can brush um, values or differences between light and dark and colors uh, together very easily. When you're using something like acrylic, you're limited as to time. But in this, I have all day to uh, create the uh, uh, kind of going into yellowy colors into a more reddish brown or orange on the breast of this metal arc. And with very tiny uh, brushes, I can get great detail going on in the fur texture of some of the animals. Sometimes I um, use an airbrush for doing things like the sky. Uh, and then also I use, uh, once I've uh, done an airbrush job, I will go in with pastel. And uh, pastel is very uh, compatible with uh, designer's colors because a designer's colors are gouache dries with what in art we call a tooth. It's a slight texture on the board. So this picks up uh, pastel very well. So I can do things like uh, take a brush and dab it in the pastel and I can actually paint clouds with a, with a powder. Um, and then I can use it as a stick as well. But I can go ahead and change it if I don't want to use an airbrush for doing some of these fine details. I can just go ahead and use pastel on it. But uh, for the most part, I tend to use brushes with my water. And just regular water is, is what you use. Then after I'm through, I usually give it a, a coating um, of uh, spray fixative to make sure that the uh, pastel will stay and not rub off. But that's basically how I create something. Uh, but um, how normally you wouldn't see all these animals together, but I was trying to show what we call a faunal assemblage where... Uh, these were potentially all the animals that could have lived at this point in um, in England or some other place. Go ahead. Mark, I'm sorry. How long would it? Oh, it's okay. I was going to ask. Um, well, one of the audience is asking, how long would it take for a full painting like that, um, or something that would see in a book book or museum? How long would it take from start to finish to complete? Well, probably in the case of something like this, it would have taken me. Um, well, maybe two and a half to three months to create something like this. Um, it, of course, depends on how complicated the scene is. Um, the more animals, of course, the longer it takes to do because they have to be checked out and made sure that they're accurate. Um, more complicated landscapes like forests, uh, rainforests or temperate forests, are going to take a lot more time than, uh, let's say, a... a, a a mammoth step or grassland like this and then of course if you're doing a uh, a coastal scene uh with broad stretches of sand that really don't have too much texture going on um this can be uh recreated much more quickly so it really depends on the kind of landscape that you're doing oops looks like we went out no we're fine still oh never mind 
Looks like we lost Mark. So we'll see if he can come back in just a second. But uh, let's see. Just want to say thank you so much to everybody for joining us today as we try to see if Mark gets back to us. Um, but yeah, if you like programs like this and want to support more programs like it at the ALF Museum, you can always find links on how to do that below. Um, moving forward, we might hopefully be able to have Discovery Day back in person, but we'll still try to have more Discovery Day online um, to share with all the really cool stories from the world of paleontology with all of our audience members across the United States and across the world. Um, so yeah, I think we'll try to see if Mark can get back in just a second. Um, but for now, let's see if I can get him back. Give me one second, everybody. So okay, oh, Mark's back. Have... Any other questions? Yeah, we did. Um, so before we get back, let me just answer this question. So uh, for those of you watching, all of the Discovery Day online live streams and all the live streams from the museum will be available on our YouTube channel for viewing right after. So if you missed a bit or if you want to go back and watch them, they're all there right away. So a question that we had since we're back was from Jared McGowan, who was asking um, what specimen is or are you which okay sorry i messed that up what specimen oh, mark are you most proud of are you excited and most memorable that you've worked on and recreated wow i have to think about that for a second or two because uh, there have been so many uh animals that i've been fascinated with um i think probably uh I would have to go to the uh, dinosaurs, like sauropod dinosaurs, for that. Um, like you, Gabe, uh, I had a favorite dinosaur when I was growing up. I think it was probably Diplodocus, uh, because uh, sauropod dinosaurs have always been fascinating to me because they were so huge and majestic, um, their long necks and tails and their uh, their elephant-like uh, limbs were were really great. Oh, I just wanted them to see that. Um, we're so we're so amazing. Um, uh, and um, in 2016, I wrote and designed and illustrated the book um, called "The Sauropod Dinosaurs: um, Life in the Age of Giants" with um, Johns Hopkins University Press. Uh, and then later on, I I did one on the big cats. But I would say probably the sauropod dinosaurs because they are to me so uh, unknowable almost like desmond stylians we just don't know that much about them fascinated me so that's probably one of my favorites but i'm very much a paleo mammal person too so right now i'm really intrigued by the desmond stylians and um yeah, i'm one of those terrible sneaky people who likes dinosaurs and paleo mammals can't be trusted it seems like sometimes when you go to uh uh vertebrate paleontology conventions uh there are little cliques that form of people who like either dinosaurs or mammals and they think it's terrible that uh that people are into the other thing uh but i like both and i gravitate um around between both of them also to make matters worse i love paleoanthropology i'm fascinated especially by neanderthals uh that's one of my favorite uh types of human being i'm really intrigued by them so i read a lot about them oh i think you might be cutting out or Hold on. Can you hear me oh, now? I got... Okay. Sorry. I think the audio was down. 
<laughs> I think I switched over to the wrong channel. Um, oh, I was saying that, you know, with billions of years of history of life on Earth, I think it's totally fair to say that there are just too many cool things that have lived on this planet to choose one. Oh, there are. There there were, yeah. It's it's very hard to choose. Um, uh, of course, you know, living in the time we are, we're surrounded by mammals, uh, hopefully for, for a long time to come. Um, and we're fortunate because having mammals, modern mammals with us, it makes it easier to uh, restore or reconstruct fossil mammals. In the case of dinosaurs, uh, these were different from any other thing we really had around us. Uh, we're, of course, finding out that uh, theropod dinosaurs were very bird-like. So uh, I was very pleased to see in the trailer in Jurassic Park that at least some of the dinosaurs had feathers. That was really exciting. And of course, they they showed a brief uh, view of uh, what looked like a Quetzalcoatlus uh, with some kind of fur-like covering. So they were uh, very bat-like in some ways. Um, intriguingly, tiny pterosaurs, uh, the size of sparrows, have been found too uh, near Ignathids, with with short uh, heads, tiny teeth. And so I think that um, uh, pterosaurs are are amazing as well. And uh, we probably have a lot more. Uh, that we'll that we'll find could be discovered. I'm waiting for a pterosaur that was like a raptor, like a like an eagle or a hawk, to be discovered. <laughs> I don't see why there couldn't have been something like that around um, uh, bats as well. Could there have been possibly a nighttime flying uh, owl-like bat somewhere that would have been a terror to uh, nighttime creatures? Um, Every time we think we've discovered everything we know, something else comes up, some new discovery pops up, which makes it really exciting. So I think in a lot of ways, we're really living in a golden age of paleontology again. Uh, we had one oh, probably 70 years ago, and now it's back again. And hopefully we'll keep finding things and discovering new things that will come up. Um, a great thing is that uh, because of the amount of attention that fossil discoveries get, um, that tends to draw in more uh, funding support. And also areas of the uh, of the earth that were neglected, for example, Africa and parts of Asia and South America are now being re-examined for their fossil potential. And we're finding that these areas, rather than being uh, fossil poor, are actually fossil rich areas that have a lot to offer that are uh, just full of things waiting to be discovered. So you've got to get out there and uh, rub around in the dirt and find them. And this is <laughs> extremely exciting for me. I can't wait for the newest discovery to come up. Lots of amazing stories and lots of stuff for you to start drawing, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. Well, if, if it wasn't for uh, for uh, uh, Ray Troll, I, I probably wouldn't have rediscovered Nesbitt Stylians. I'd always been intrigued by them, but I happened to read his amazing book, Cruise Fossil Coastline. Uh, companion book to cruise the fossil freeway and he loves Desmond Stylians and oh, yeah. so he really got my flowing and I got back into uh, being interested in them and I thought gee I really don't know as much about them as I'd like to I better start reading about them and then after I'd read all of the papers that he sent me I started drawing them I felt well now I can finally start making drawings of them now that I know a little bit more about them so I'm now I'm really excited about doing more and more Desmond Stylians and what I'd like to do is to uh, uh, actually uh, create paintings. And my dream job would be to be uh, called by National Geographic magazine and say, hey, Mark, how would you like to do a three-page fold-out showing uh, Desmostylians and giant sharks and uh, ancient pinnipeds all swimming around in a, in a three-page spread uh, and I'll have the story about California's uh, vanished fossil inland sea? I think that would be something really exciting. So uh, that would be a dream come true. So, uh, yeah, that would be fun. And then, of course, I would love to work for do some more work for museums as well. And I hope someday I'll be able to come up and see your museum. I've never been there. Yeah. If you're ever in L.A. area, just let me know. We're happy to show you all around the ALF Museum. Oh, that would be great. I would love that very much. Um, it looks like we're just about up for time. So one last question, Mark, that we usually sure. like to ask all of our guests What's one piece of advice you'd like to give to future science illustrators out there? 
I think probably the most important uh, advice you gave is just never lose confidence in your own ability to to visualize what you you love. Um, keep a notebook, draw on it every day if you can. Keep your pencil sharpened. If you do a, a new drawing every day, it's like practicing a musical instrument or learning to dance or doing anything else that requires eye hand mind coordination. Keep doing it because every time you do something new, you'll get better and better. And um, never let anyone tell you you shouldn't or you can't do it because if you believe you can, you can. So that's my main advice. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Mark. Oh, really quick. Uh, Ed Welsh, sure. uh, who is a great paleontologist out at Badlands, actually just commented, uh, would you like to come work with us at Badlands National Park for a bit? If so, how can we make it happen? So if you like, Mark, oh. I'll have, you can connect you guys back. Okay, that would be great. Thanks, Gabe. I'd sure love to go out and visit there. That would be awesome. So what a pleasure this was. I really enjoyed talking to you and your guests. And thanks so much for having me on. Oh, thank you. It's been an awesome pleasure to have you on the show. And we're really excited that we got to see some really cool artwork. And for me, that you got to show the Desmosilians, this was probably the best thing I've been able to do all week. So thank you so oh, much for that. That's great. And hey, and thanks for getting up early so you could do all this. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. Take care. It Bye, and thank you everybody so much for joining us. As always, if you want to support programs like this at the ALF Museum, you can find links on how to do that in description below. And as always, make sure you like and subscribe for more stories from the world of paleontology. We'll see you all at 1.30 for our next Discovery Day online session with paleo artist uh, Cullen Townsend. We'll see you all then. Bye, everybody. Bye.